think this time next week that it will be next week we'll finish the series um, in uh, doctrine of imputations. But uh, again, we've looked at different ones uh, of our of the uh, imputations that we've looked at. And that is God blessing us with something that He has imputed or put into us, or He has accounted to us, credited to us. Um, and there have been a lot of things that we've looked at in these last 50-some lessons uh, from the first lesson that we did, from all the things that are a part of our life, our reality, um, from Adam in the Garden of Eden, and now we're talking about blessings that are imputed to the Christian, the believer, in eternity at the judgment seat of Christ for the believer's rewards. Again, salvation is by grace through faith, but the rewards, the Bible says, we're to work for those. Uh, and it's by his power and his strength being poured into us and being right with the Lord and having our motivations right in our works that God is free to bless us according to his divine righteousness. <clears throat> we have not violated his righteousness uh, during the process of us and our service to him. And... Um, so there's a lot involved here. We have blessings in time. We looked at we looked at a lot of those, and then blessings in eternity. We're just covered with blessings, and um, I'm gonna tell you that a grateful heart um, is always uh, ready for more blessings. Uh, it's the uh, dried up heart that cannot absorb blessings very well. Uh, the Book of Hebrews uh, talks about that pretty much. Hebrews chapter 6 talks about the believer who will not stay in the faith that they are like the earth. Verse 6, when the rain comes, it just runs off. It doesn't soak in. And uh, we don't want to be that way. Uh, the Bible says uh, souls like that, all they do is bear thorns and briars and are nigh unto cursing. But uh, he said, we're persuaded of better things of you and things that accompany the salvation that you have. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. And often it's an it's a, it's a unconditional love that we show uh, that uh, helps keep us going. Our love for God and our love for our fellow man. Not necessarily I like for our fellow man or our liking what God is letting us go through but we have established a trust in God that produces a love for God that he won't fail us he'll never leave us nor forsake us and because of that we continue to uh, do the will of God we continue some to minister to the saints and do minister as Hebrews 6.10 says and he even said that we, as a result, desire that every one of you continue to show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope or confidence unto the end. That we are not to be slothful, but followers of those who through faith and patience will inherit the promises. And so there are qualifications. And as we noted about the crown, just about all of these crowns, the crown of righteousness, the crown of life, the crown of glory, there is suffering that comes <coughs> Uh, on the on the front of that, in some form or fashion, keeping the faith, keeping the stay in the course, not turning uh, away from the faith. That's so important. Uh, this life is so short con compared to the trillions, or actually eternity ahead of us. It's what I call the eternal day. There is so much uh, involved. This is basics number five forty six. Wednesday, February 15th, 2023. If it's not the 15th, I've got the wrong notes. <laughs> this is the watchman's read. Okay. This is wrong. Now, we talked somewhat. Hebrews 13, if you want to turn there, please. Hebrews 13. We talked about somewhat about this before. Um, we've left the first... Peter chapter 5 passage of the crown of glory for those who will do the job of the Lord and help lead the people and take whatever comes their way as a result of it. Um, 
And I said about the crowns that every believer is, is, is as it were, employed by an equal opportunity Lord who gives us all the same opportunity. And it is what we do with that opportunity that matters. Um, do we take advantage of it? Learn? Uh, do we um, always have to be uh, fighting the bit? You know, the Lord, as it were, puts a bit in our mouth. You know, there's a tender part in the back of the horse's mouth. You have to be careful when you use the bit. Uh, not that it's a tender place in the back of the lip there. And you have to be careful that you don't have it too tight. And the Lord doesn't put it too tight in us. But usually when the horse's mouth gets really sore is that they're fighting the bit all the time. They're trying to spit it out, especially a one that's just recently been broken. And uh, sometimes uh, we're, we're like a little wild buck. You know, we like to, we just can't stand to have the Lord to ride us. We just can't stand to have the Lord to, to, to steer us or which way or way he wants us to go. We just don't like him putting the saddle or the, the blanket or the saddle on us. We, and we definitely don't like the spurs when he needs us to get up and get going. But in a sense, you know, uh, and he's doing it for our good. He takes good care of us. And he's not going to take us where we can't, be t prepared to be taken care of because uh, he's sovereign and he will take care of us. But when we fight the bit all the time, uh, we're going we're gonna to be sore. And eventually, uh, we're going to try to buck him off. And uh, we won't get rid of him, but we'll end up being the ones put in the barn, kept in the barn until we uh, think about it a little while. That Paul called that being like a pot that doesn't hold any water anymore. It's called a castaway. A dokimos is the word there in Corinthians where he said, I don't want to be a dokimos. I don't want to be like a crack pot that doesn't hold water for the Lord anymore. That I, I'm not dependable. And so uh, dependability is more important than talent. Uh, faithfulness is more important than personality. Personality doesn't mean anything. Uh, talent doesn't mean anything. A lot of people, they go looking for talent and they go looking for personality when really it's faithfulness that is the key because it is faithfulness where God trusts you. And uh, I want, in the end of my life, I want it to be so that God says, well, I can trust you. And I, I believe that we all want to, to, to have the well done, thou good and faithful servant. But that won't come to any believer who is not trustworthy. <coughs> And so we have to, we're not perfect, but trust, we confess our sins when we're wrong to God. And he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, all of it. But he calls on us to be faithful privately, not just publicly, but privately. And we all know that. So we're talking about a little bit about the watchman's wreath today. And we'll look at these verses of scripture that goes with that particular wreath. But Hebrews 13, 17, I'll close out, I'll open up by saying what I closed out with is that those who have a responsibility of spiritual leadership, uh, as the church, we are to be aware that they watch for your souls as they, in that day, this is talking about the time when we're giving account of our life at the judgment seat of Christ, for they watch for your souls as they must give account. And they have to give account an account as to what the Lord might ask regarding how God might bless that believer with even more blessings at that time. God is not trying to be withholding of blessings at the beam of seat. He's trying to give out as many as he can, but they cannot violate his justice. He already knows what he's going to do, but he is holding our feet to the accountability. Or do we're, and we won't have a sin nature where we would be tempted to commit perjury at the judgment seat of Christ. We won't be tempted to try to lie or to snozzle over the Lord or pull the wool over his eyes because we won't have a sin nature to hide behind. We find so many ways to dis that we get deceived by our old nature to justify the things that we think and say and do. And at that day, it'll just be, I stand corrected, Lord. I stand corrected, Lord. It's like God will give you a truth serum when that day comes. He'll give me a truth serum. And the truth serum was only because there's no sin nature in us to try to weasel ourselves from anything or to try to overbrag something. <clears throat> well, you know, I did this, Lord. I did no, none of that jazz. It won't be necessary. He's already read the script. <laughs> he already knows it all. He's 
omniscient, and he's uh, omnipotent. He's omniscient. It means he, he knows everything. He he's, he's the consummate know-it-all. I have a book at the house. Why this person said they didn't like God anymore because he was a know-it-all. And uh, he was not going to be facetious or whatever, but uh, I'm glad God knows it all because he knows what we need. He sees what's happening. But anyway, the, there are those who, and this context was the pastors, they watch for your soul. They've got to give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable, that is for the believer. And so that day will come. But there's another type of crown too, and that's uh, Philippians 4.1 and 1 Thessalonians 2.19. So that is the same uh, context there. So I'm going to turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 1. Philippians 4, verse 1, the watchman grief. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. He's talking to the believers at Philippi. My brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown. And then you can just jot down, if you don't have it in your notes, 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 19. That same phrase is used when Paul said to the Thessalonians, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing or crown of joy are not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Think of all the people that you as a believer either have witnessed to or have been a Christian help to, that you helped them along the way. They are there because of the blood of Christ. No thing, nothing you either witnessed to or you've been a part of their, either their salvation or you've been a part of their edification. How happy their happiness is at the Bema seat when that great ceremony is finally consummating and you help them. And there will be the others who helped you along the way. And they'll rejoice that you're saved. They don't believe they saved you. But they believe that the testimony they gave. Or the edification and the things of God that helped your understanding. Was a great blessing to them. Your application of the truth. Whether in word or in deed. Was a help to them. All of that community will come into full fruition when that time happens at the Bema Seat of Christ. There's a lot more than just being judged for our rewards. There's also the rejoicing of us seeing each other in the end after it's, con it's con uh, consummated with a great, great uh, ceremony. So Paul looked at the believer as his crown of rejoicing. So it's not a real crown in the sense that it's the type that has the type of remuneration that will come from the other crowns. This is a crown that is in a remuneration of joy in the community of those that you were a part of here in time. From these two passages, Paul is not saying there is a soul winner's crown, as some have called this, or a soul winner's wreath to be more doctrinal according to the history of the crowns and the wreaths and the uh, the day and time when it was brought out regarding the Olympic Games or a military victor coming back from battle. So Paul is not saying there's a soul winner's crown or to be more scriptural, the soul witnessing wreath because we're not winners, we're witnesses. We're never called to be winners. The Hebrew there in the Old Testament, Laqua, for he that winneth souls is wise, has nothing to do with witnessing the gospel. But it's been used over and over because people are just simple. <laughs> Paul is telling us that those whom he led to Christ and those with whom he and others have helped to lead to maturity, that they themselves will be a crown of rejoicing when we all get to heaven, like the song says. Seeing those whom you witness to be there will be an additional blessing. 
I witnessed the buddies when I was in the military 45 years ago. I witnessed the family members over the years and other people. I've led people to the Lord. And then there have been people that uh, I have led to the Lord that I didn't know and until later on or never would know. And same for you. And that is a great blessing to, to know that you, you played a small part in that as a witness. And the word witness is martyros, and it means a martyr. You're willing to lose it all for him. That's what the word witness in the Greek is, is martyros or martyr. So seeing those whom you helped in their spiritual growth receive rewards when that day come will cause your heart to leap. It's not like the Lord can't replay that for us. We have our own time with the Lord at the Bema Seat of Christ where he will judge us. And since he is omnipresent, he will be able to judge every New Testament believer at the same time. Because otherwise, it's going to be a long wait standing there waiting your turn. And you only got seven years for it to happen. Now, I don't know how the time works in heaven versus time on earth, but it's approximately seven years, maybe a little bit longer than that prior leading up to the tribulation period on the earth. But this happens in the heavens during the tribulation period. Because when we come back, we've got our robes of righteousness. And they're pure and white. We've already been uh, through the Bema Seat of Christ. Uh, we've already had the wedding ceremony. And then the marriage of the Lamb. Actually, there is a marriage supper down here too. There is those guests that you go out to the highways and the byways to compel to come in at that time which will see a consummation of not only those who are part of the New Testament, but also those who are part of the Old Testament who are believers who then have gotten their rewards. And you're going to be co-mingling and working with them, plus all those who live through the tribulation period who got saved during that time, who lived through that, were not martyred, and are part of the human seedbed for the whole earth for that thousand-year reign of Christ. So I know all of y'all know that already, but I thought I'd just throw it out there free of charge again. There's a lot more to happen. And I'm going to tell you, Vladimir Putin or uh, Chairman Chi cannot just be standing around waiting to push a big red button. Like Trump says, my red button's bigger than yours. You know, of course it is. <laughs> That's not going to end the world. That's, God's going to end the world in good time, but not that way. it's not going to happen that way. They don't have control of the world because they don't even have control of themselves. <laughs> but anyway... We're on the winning team, and those crowns are going to be passed out. There's a great remuneration that comes to the individual, and then there's great collaboration that comes with that as well. And those people that you are collaborated with in time or led to the Lord in time or at least witnessed to that eventually maybe down the road got saved, uh, that is part of uh, your reward as well. That is part of your reward as well. And Paul saw that in the Thessalonians. He saw that in the, in the Philippian, uh, uh, the believers at Philippi. So he was, he was saying, you're really, my, you're really my reward. Just the fellowship that we have. And then in, in eternity, there won't be any conflict because there's no sinful tendency to fight and argue or feel dejected or anything. As far as the pastor's responsibilities goes, as I said last time, they don't cease, according to Hebrews 13, 17. And he's still got just a few more responsibilities that he's going to be, his feet will be called to the fire. Jesus Christ, uh, in, as we know, is a personal Savior and Lord. And so his blessings to us are done at a personal basis. They're not done in some sort of a cold corporate laboratory. I've received rewards. Some of you probably have as well received rewards uh, from your employer uh, or in the military and um, it's kind of a cold cut and dry get up and take it and salute and back off salute take it and sit down whatever or you get it from some award from your employer a little plaque or something or a watch or whatever or just some recognition and it's very um, well it, it's friendly in a way but it's mostly a platonic thing uh, and But I think that when it comes to the judgment seat of Christ, Jesus is pulling for us so hard. He's pulling for us so hard. Come on, you can do it. Come on, you can do it. And it is not some sort of a... Jesus Christ is not some sort of a platonic figurehead, an emotionalist 
cor cold corporate figurehead. He is a personal commander. He's like the commander when you're out there on guard duty at nighttime. And you would expect the sergeant of arms to come out every once in a while or him to send one of the sergeants or the corporals out just to check on you when you're in the foxhole. And it's the colonel that comes out. He's out there at 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And he said, How, how's it going, Private? How's it going, Specialist? How's, how's it going, Sarge? It, it's him himself. And, and what are you talking about a morale boost when the, you look down in that full, that, those wings, that, that bird is looking at you? That, that is, that's inspiring, especially if you're just a peon, you know, is what we call ourselves most of the time, and this, this guy would come out and check on us. That was, that was always a big deal, and, you, you know, you, you go into fire for a person like that. It's amazing how that inspires. Well, that's the kind of commander Jesus Christ is. Just ask the three young men in Nebuchadnezzar's furnace if Jesus didn't go into the fire with them. He stayed in the fire with them. And he stayed in the fire with you. And he's going to pull with you all the way to the judgment seat of Christ. So he says those who do what they need to do to help encourage you. Uh, getting back to this Hebrews text, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but uh, the watchman's wreath again is the wreath that comes with it's a fellowship type of wreath that comes with us willing to be led, willing to learn, as the Hebrews 13, 17 passage says, that we're willing to obey and to and to be persuaded. That's what that word means in Hebrews 13, 17. Obey them, they have the rule over you. The word obey means allow them to be pers allow yourself to be persuaded in the word. Persuaded to uh, to, to listen to those who have the get oh my that is the responsibility to lead because with that comes stars in your crown oh my goodness there are things that the believer and the pastors as a unit get that citation as it were some of you that have been in know what that the guide on is it's your company uh, uh, poll, as you want to call it, and it's got all the campaigns you've been in, and that guide on right there, and it's got the ribbons on it that your unit has earned, and when you go out on, on the parade field, that guide on is out there in the front, and whoever, sergeant, whoever's given the opportunity to carry that guide on out there carries that thing on a pole, and all those citations that your unit has earned even back World War II and World War I are on that pole. Whenever your unit started, the, the, the citations for what your unit earned are still hanging on that pole. It is your heritage. It is your history. And when you look up there and you see all those ribbons hanging off that pole, they're about this long, they are the campaigns that your unit has participated in up to date. And you follow your guide on. The guide on of the cross, the guide on for the believer is the cross of Christ. The guide on of the cross is a song. You follow that guide on. You that that pole that's got all those citations. You follow that. That's your colors. And when you follow that, you stay close to your commander. And it's a proud moment in the military, and it's also in a spiritual sense. A re sense of joy and rejoicing when it's with the Lord. It's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. If you've never been part of it, you know, I'm just telling you, it's a wonderful thing. And there will be great drill and ceremony as, in a sense, as it were, because when it is seen in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 23, each one will be presented in their own kind, in their own way. It is a picture of picture of a military parade. It is a picture of pass and review. The judges stand. That's when after all the rewards have been given out, all the citations have been given out. It'd be a wonderful time. And so it says in that Hebrews 13, 17 passage that we pull together as a team and we stick together as a team. 
and we submit to the word. Uh, hupaiko there, present active imperative, it means to yield to the word, not to a man, but to the word. The believer, while hearing the word, allows himself to be persuaded to follow the word, pytho, to be persuaded to follow the word of God. And so as the believer listens and grows in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, the believer is not to be taking some sort of notes figuring out how they can figure out how they can argue by the end of the service. I can imagine listening to my drill instructors teaching me how to use a law, light anti-tank weapons or M60s and stuff like that, and I'm sitting there figuring out, I don't think he knows what he's talking about. Those idiots don't last long in the field. They don't last, they're not going to last long. They will not be deployed, I can tell you that. I had three buddies that did not get deployed when we went to Central America because they were idiots. They were always trouble. And I don't hate to say this, but two of them were my best friends. <laughs> because they were nothing but trouble. After I got married, they just fell apart because they didn't have me to lean on. And so she, she took care of me, and they just lost it. They just lost it, <laughs> I guess. No. Well, there's a little bit of truth to that. You know that. They slept on our couch at times. You know that, too. I can't believe you had a life before you were a pastor. <laughs> Y'all tell me about yours, too. I guess mine's just a little more public, I guess. But there have been those who could not wait until the service was over to straighten out their pastor. Well, sometimes pastors need straightening out, but it's to be done privately. But if that's all i got time to do, I'm definitely probably not going to get a jack squat at the beam of seat of Christ because the Lord set that, that guy, that fallible guy, out there for a reason. Not going to be right about everything. None of them are. But if that pastor sticks with the word, he will improve with his doctrinal accuracy. 1 Timothy 4, 11 through 16 says he will. First, uh, Titus 1, verses 5 through 11 says he'll have to even be good enough to muzzle the gainsayers to put them at silence. Good gracious. It's a rough job at times. Titus 1, verse 5 says, Paul said, I left Titus at Crete that thou shouldest set in order things that are lacking there and appoint elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Titus 1 and verse 5. This is part of what he was told to do, and he got a lot of pushback. This will be this will come up at the Bema seat. I'm not talking about trying to get things that are wrong corrected. I mean this perpetual penchant to argue. This will come up at the Bema seat. For this cause left I thee at Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting or lacking. And ordain means to appoint elders in every city. The word elders there is accusative, masculine, and plural. There are no female pastors. Female teachers, yes, but not female pastors. That's fine. There are ordained elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Paul had authority from the Lord God Jesus himself to do that. And if any be a mempos, that is, not sinless, but blameless. He had a good testimony among mankind. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of wild living or unruly. For a bishop, that's the same thing as this elder here. This bishop and elder, it's the two words, two different <coughs> parts of the pastor's job. He's both elder and pastor and bishop. He's an overseer. For a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. In other words, he's that's an important responsibility, a steward. A steward is the one who represents the house. I don't represent man's house. I don't represent modern culture's house. Don't represent uh, what's fad, what fads are going along. Don't represent a college's or seminary's house. We, or, de uh, or, or a um, denomination's house, we, we represent the house of God, a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, not violent, not given to ill-gotten gain or filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, lover of good men, 
sober-minded, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be, that he may be able by sound doctrine to both to exhort and to confute the gainsayers. For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they in that case in that day of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. And that word stopped in the Greek means to be muzzled like a dog. Because they're dangerous. False teachers are dangerous. Whose mouths must be stopped. Though they go in, they subvert whole houses, they teach things which they ought not for ill-gotten gain. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and gluttons. The word in the Greek there is gastrous orgi. I don't want to go into any further than what that means. That is not a pretty sight. So you have the responsibility for helping to maintain doctrinal biblical accuracy. And no one is going to be perfect. That's certainly true. But what I'm saying, I'm saying here for our own good, sometimes things that are hard to say, but at the Bema Seat of Christ, this is all going to come out. It will all come out. Nobody will get away scot-free. I won't get away scot-free. And the reason why is because he will turn over every rock to see where he can bless you. That's what he's doing. And you say, you know what? You could have argued. You could have really shown your hind end, but you didn't. You showed restraint. You showed respect for the office. And in doing so, here's another little jewel to go in your crown. This is what this is talk I'm talking about. This is where you earn the extra jewels in your crown at the Bema Seat. It's not like you're going to wear this Burger King hat around forever. It, it is symbolic. You throw those to the feet of Christ. Well, but they glorify Christ, you know. Everything he's given you that is not just the crown, but what the crown is made up of represents your faithfulness to the Lord in time. Amen. Learning to suppose, that, and no preacher should act let on like he knows it all. Because he doesn't know it all. That's why you think, why do you think he studies all the time? Because he knows he's so far behind. <laughs> Y'all study... You know, some of y'all study many hours of the week, many days of the week. Some of you don't study maybe as much. You're just so busy doing so many other things. But I have to study a lot because I have to kind of keep up with you anyway if I can. The reason why the pastor studies all the time is because he knows he doesn't know it all. Some, people, some pastors stop studying, stop learning, because they already think they know enough. You never know enough. Always be aware that the pastor watches for your soul. Christianity is personal. It's not a business. pastor must know how to help. He doesn't have to know everything because that, the Holy Spirit will lead the pastor to study and teach what God knows that you need. No television preacher or radio preacher can do this for you. They don't even know you exist. They are not watching for your soul. They are not going to give an account for your soul, but this pastor will give an account for this, these souls. They don't even know who you are. But your God-appointed right pastor teacher does. That's the genius of God. That's the genius of the local church. And it is he who must give an account. Future active participle of the Greek word apodidome. Again, Hebrews 13, 17. He has to give an answer. He, do, he cannot uh, mumble and uh, <coughs> kind of halfway cover his mouth when the Lord asks him a question and just kind of mumble and fade off into the background. He can't do that. He will have to answer for what he teaches. What sort of answer will he give? What sort of answer will you give? Well, the answer will be based upon not only that, but also how we lived our lives as believers. Did the pastor study and teach what the Bible says? Did you come to be fed by your under-shepherd? Did you heed the scriptural warnings given through the watchman, overseer? Did you avoid or disobey the instruction that would have brought glory to the Lord and blessing to yourself? Those are questions that I have to answer because I was a member here for 27 years, so I'll have to answer those questions myself. I know that I've got 27 years that Dr. Richard Frampton will be there. I believe that as sure as I'm standing right in front of you, according to Hebrews 13, 17. Because the Lord will turn over every stone to give me a blessing. And you'll give a blessing to him as well. A great blessing, I believe. 
He's got a head. Our former pastor had a head built for crowns. <laughs> he's a wonderful man, and he's with the Lord now. He just looked like a crown kind of guy. But the watchman teaches the word so the believer will avoid the pitfalls and traps of Satan's deceitful cosmic system. And part of the great blessings that we're seeing on tonight's The Watchman's Reef is that we do this together. This, no, we don't do this in a vacuum. I don't do my job in a vacuum as a pastor and as the people of this church. You don't do what you do in a vacuum either. It is a community. It's called a fellowship. Koinonia is not done in a vacuum. It is done organically, spiritually organically. Fellowship is, is an organic thing. And some people we've had over the years, not with us anymore, not even with the earth anymore, <laughs> Uh, could not grasp the organic aspect of the Christian community or Christian fellowship. And for whatever reason, God only knows, could not connect, afraid to connect, uh, maybe talked down to and treated wrong as a young Christian or young person and had such a low self-esteem that they would not speak up. And you get some that, you know, just can't show up. <laughs> As always, the opposite. And God bless both. There's both the, the blessing of both and it can be the curse of both. You know that. But the watchman teaches the word so the believer will avoid the pitfalls and traps of Satan's deceitful system. Because Satan's system of antagonism toward God is a system that is dear to the old sin nature. It is dear, near and dear to the desire of the old sin nature to get you to run like your tail was on fire away from the Bible. And Satan knows how to work that system against you and me. Satan's cosmic system of antagonism against God is found in humanism, your human dignity, and the perfecting of humanity through various fields of study. That's what that is. Humanism basically is a philosophy of life or perfecting or trying to enhance and build up and exalt the, well, an anthropocentric world where man is the center of the world, woman is the center of the world. But also his system is found in secularism, which is a form of morality without God. That's why there will be those who will do their good deeds in place of having a true Easter or a true Christmas. They have their secular way of doing things. It's their 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 substitute or their counterfeit for divine morality and divine goodness. Many believers come to resent and resist the word of God as a direct result of a mental preoccupation and a heartfelt acceptance of humanism and secularism. I'm better than that. We're better than that. We don't need to hear that blood-stained cross. We don't need to hear that Bible stuff. It's too old-fashioned. What is it Taylor Swift said that she would not follow the Bible because that was that old Bible, I believe, in my own version of Christianity. And that's what she said here when they had their rewards thing a couple weeks ago. That's why it's just a big blow, blowhards, all they are, a bunch of blowhards. He, she devil, blowhards is what they are, and he devils too. Don't believe in this, in the Christianity from that old Bible. It's so outdated, you know, but she believes in her new form of Christianity, which is, you know, Social justice. All that is the new form of Christianity. And wokeism, that's the new form of Christianity. That is what is going to be used as an impetus to persecute Christians in this generation. That's what we're looking at, folks. If you believe that life begins at conception, if you believe in the freedom of speech, that God is real, if you do not believe that you come from an ape, then you are an enemy of the state, pretty much. If you don't believe that a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man, then you are an enemy of the state. That is the woke morality. And there are people that our kids and adults follow on a regular basis who let on, like, uh, oh, she's wonderful or he's wonderful or whatever. See what they believe. Because they're not fit to follow if they don't follow the bloodstained banner of the cross. They're not fit. They are not on your team. They're not on God's team. They're rogue elements. That's what they are. I put something on Facebook when I saw that, and I made a comment that 
Cain thought that the word of God was old-fashioned in his day. And he was the very first human born on the planet. He also, in his sinfulness, murdered his brother Abel, whose blood, the Bible says, still cries in the ground as a testimony against the unrighteousness of Abel. The righteousness of God that Abel showed in his faithfulness to standing up for the things of God irked his brother Cain, and Cain killed him in a fit of jealousy and rage because Cain thought that human good was far superior than divine good. The human works was far superior than shed blood. You know, Adam and Eve taught them two boys the same doctrine, and one of them went off the cray-cray, and the other was killed. Yeah. Many believers come to resent and resist the word. We can't do that. But it will be a sad day if they are a Christian at the judgment seat of Christ. It will be the first time that some believers will actually give an honest answer for their life. It will be the first time they will give an honest estimation of where they have succeeded and, yes, where they have failed. We don't want to admit that nowadays, but we need to be in a place where we can do that. And that takes a lot of humility, folks, and you know it. It does for me. If a pastor is not diligent in instructing his people, it will be a bad day for him. Doesn't he's not, he's not going to lose his salvation, but he's going to lose his rewards. But if the believer was taught, regardless of whether they accepted it or not, if the believer was taught, as Peter said to, G, to as Jesus said to Peter, "If you love me, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep." If the believer, though, was taught and would not accept the word, it'll be unprofitable, Hebrews 13, 17. It will be unprofitable for them that day. One of the things I said almost 20 years ago when I became the pastor here is that one of my, my main responsibilities is not to make it easy, but to make it plain and to prepare the people in this church for the judgment seat of Christ. And I haven't given up on that. I've been battle-tested a few times, and I... I still got a little gas in the tank. Amen. I'm not one of those EVs. <laughs> so it all comes down to the believer and their attitude toward God and his word. And that applies to this old guy and any other preacher out there as well. And their people. We are on a team. And Jesus Christ is pulling for us. But the believer who won't submit to the word, it won't be good. But those who do, it will be a joyous and prosperous occasion. And there will be a time of great rejoicing because of that. There will be additional rejoicing in heaven one day for any believer who has witnessed salvation to the lost and for the believer who has ministered helpful biblical teaching and advice to fellow believers who want to please the Lord. Whether it's in your family or your friends or strangers. We are all here to be helped and to help one another along the way. And not one of us will prove in him or herself to be perfect. None of us are perfect. But we don't strive for imperfection. <laughs> be ye holy as I'm holy, the Lord said. So let us run the race well. Let the Lord encourage us as we move forward. And in the end, it will be worth it all to us. It will be worth it all in the end. I believe that the watchman's wreath of 1 Thessalonians 2.19 and Philippians 4.1, that crown of rejoicing, as it were, is, is just like the happiness, the levels of happiness that you're going to experience uh, when you are in the presence of the Lord one of these days. Not just when you're in his presence, but when you're living your life. You and I have an eternity to learn a lot of things. And then there's going to be the millennium, and then there's going to be the new heavens and the new earth, and what life will be like in the new heavens and the new earth. So often the only thing that we can do is imagine, because otherwise all we do is just kind of go about our way of thinking, well, it won't have the need of the sun, it won't have all these oceans that it has now. It won't, well, that's all just geographics. Is that all we got? Pretty much. There's not a lot that tells you what spiritual life will be like. We know because there will be no sin, no more death among the human race. 
Because there will be deaths until the end of the millennial kingdom. Of people dying on the earth during that time. Just because you have the possibility for longevity of life doesn't mean you're going to have it. Those people who live during that day. You and I as believers, we will have the resurrected and glorified body, service of the Lord at some level, at some, some degree, at some level. That'll be a great time. I have a series on the millennial kingdom. Maybe get into that next, but that's where you're headed. For all those who are all mill, post mill, in their theology, they, they're going to sit there with their jaws dropped when the Lord puts them to work cleaning up the blood around the temple, raking up, cleaning up land wool, there'll be sacrifice official system for a thousand years. Well, anyway, let's just stop right there. What? We won't go any further. It's speculation after a while, but when we have the doctrine, the teaching is not speculation. Good to see everyone tonight. Thank you, Father, for this day and for your word. Thank you for the encouragement that you give us. Thank you that as a community of believers, not only do we learn and grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ together, both pastor and people, but we pull for one another. We pray for one another during the week. We are confidently expecting uh, wonderful times uh, in the future and also a wonderful time in, in the heavens as well one day. And we had only you to thank for that, Father, for your divine plan and for what Jesus has done as part of the Trinity. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have uh, shown to us just how much you care for us by 2,000 years ago sending the second person of the Godhead, the Lord Jesus, down to earth to be the ransom sacrifice for the sins of mankind. And thank you for your divine plan for those who receive the gospel that we can be part of a royal family of God, that we can learn and grow and have a little peek into the mysteries of eternity and into heaven. And uh, we thank you for that as, as, as being inspiring to us as all we normally get here on this world and this earth is bad news and hopeless causes. We thank you that all your causes have complete confidence and hope in them that they will come to pass. So we just ask for your grace and mercy to be upon us. Thank you again for all you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.